Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Carthage at the Kibbe Museum where on the anniversary of Lincoln's assassination, a new exhibit opened. It involved the building of a log cabin and the East Room in the White House. You gotta see this. Kim Nettles, the first thing you see is the log cabin when you come into the Lincoln exhibit. It's quite something, and isn't it? And it, it really is quite something because it's the real thing, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's about the same dimensions as an 1830 log cabin would have been in Illinois. It's 12 feet wide and uh, 10 feet deep. And you're standing next to the, uh, this is the honest to God six foot four Lincoln. This is the size he was. Yes, he was. I even put my husband next to verify the height. Okay, all right. And this, this uh, cudgel or whatever he's swinging here is also would be, uh, have been the size of the tool that he would have had to swing. That's right. This is an original splitting maul. Mm -hmm. And so he would have been cutting with an ax and then using the maul to drive a wedge into mm -hmm. the wood to split it. Wow. Okay. When he was a child, it is said that he grew up in a cabin like this. And I, what I love about this is when you bring school groups in here, the kids, they learn that a family of maybe eight or 10 would have lived in a cabin like this, right? Well, very close families, complete with uh, bed bugs and <laughs> vermin and, yep. and dirt floors. Yep, and everything was very, uh, very rough. And uh, for instance, for, uh, that fire is very important because for probably four months of the year, you're living in severe, severe cold, and you don't get out. Kids didn't get out much. They couldn't. Nobody did. Um, there was a blizzard of uh, 1829 slash 1830. Uh, four feet of snow fell on the ground, and people did not get out until April. They had to subsist on the food that they had to get through the winter because everything was buried and the game animals. Yeah. Which, were which hard, actually scarce. made the, the agriculture work so crucial because you had to make sure you put up enough to get you through the winter. If you didn't, you died. Everything mattered. Uh, it mattered if you left a gate open uh, and the animals got loose. It mm -hmm. mattered if the coyotes ate your sheep. It mattered if you spilled a little bit of grain on the on the ground. And so even very young children learned that they had to contribute towards the survival of the family. Mm -hmm. If this is great for kids, it's also good for adults because it, re it reminds them that, uh, you know, we each have bedrooms bigger than this, but this was the, this was the whole home. Um, what, what you've tried to do here is, and it's wonderful what you've done in 3,000 square feet or so, you've tucked in not only Lincoln's life, but the life of people who lived in Hancock County. That's true, because Lincoln did not grow up in isolation. He he was not the only person that grew up in hardship. He is not the only person that lost a mother at a young age. Everybody had to work hard on the farm. And so rather than gazing upon this mythological Lincoln, we are actually turning the mirror back on the people who are around him to give us an idea of how his character was formed. Mm -hmm. And you said working hard on the farm. We're surrounded here now by farm implements of the period. And we're going to come back around and we're going to take a second look at these things. But I just want to sort of breeze through and get a look at, at, at what you've attempted to do here and how you've used your space. Um, this, this is cool because what you've done is you've, you've used as much local uh, as many local uh, items as you could. And, and that's, what, that's what we're looking at here. Right, this was the fireplace mantle in the Simpson house. Alexander Simpson was a friend of Abraham's dating all the way back to the years in Kentucky. Um, and when Lincoln came to town, he would stay with his good friend Alexander Simpson right up until 1858 when he spoke on the Carthage Square. Some 6,000 people attended his speeches there and then followed him to the Simpson house where he spoke again from mm -hmm. the doorway. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're pleased to have a number of artifacts from the Simpson home, including the doorway uh, from the home, which is now the entrance to the museum. Neat. Now we're gonna go through, this case particularly is, has some very interesting local tie-ins. And this as well, it, it, the Civil War was not only the focal point of Lincoln's life, but it was the focal point of the entire nation's life for about four years. And when we come back through here again, we're gonna to talk to a young man who helped you put this exhibit together. He had a lot of investigative work to do yes. to find out who these people were, and we're gonna find out more about that as we go. Um, now this is, is, is outstanding. What you've attempted to do here is you're looking out from a physician's tent. Right, you're looking through the back wall into the rest of the camp. Oh, how, is, how did you get that, uh, that effect? 
Well, uh, I found some candidate images from the Library of Congress. We knew we wanted something interesting that represented ca camp life, and so I went through the Library of Congress's online uh, database and found a TIFF image, which is a very high resolution mm -hmm. image, and printed it on vinyl. We worked with the printer uh, on how we wanted to create this effect. And we actually went through several iterations um, of, of ideas, and ultimately the solution was to print on, on a vinyl banner and hang it in front of a window. It's backlit by natural oh, light. by natural light. Right. So as the sun brightens during the day, uh -huh. this image brightens and becomes actually a little more cheerful towards the end of the day or <laughs> wow. when it's raining. Uh, you get more of this overcast mm -hmm. mood. Today and, it's very gray outside, yeah, so we're getting a, a, real flat, a real flat effect. Wow, that's an that's ex exceptional idea. Now, we're going to go back through, as I said, um, these items here were part of a collection that you inherited from the Illinois Funeral Directors Association, and we'll dwell on this a little bit, but you and I are now standing in a room that had to be created by one of your colleagues, yes. who we're going to get to meet a little bit later on. We are in the East Room of the White House. That's right, uh, and it's as close to uh, period detail as we could make it. We had to bring it down in scale. Oh. There was a lot of thought that had to go into the design of this room and the mood that we were wanting to create. Oh, wow. It is fantastic. And, of course, this was, uh, for those who don't know, this was the first stop for, uh, for Lincoln's dead body after the assassination before the rest of the nation got to see, uh, got to see him and, and, and pay their respects to him on the, on the train ride uh, right. across the Midwest. Uh, he was, uh, th there was a wake essentially held uh, at the East Room of the White House, uh, and then his body was placed aboard a train along with that of his son Willie, who had died while they were in service at the White House. Uh, and then there was a procession that led through the states, and the casket was taken off in each of those towns, and the citizens were allowed to come by and view his mm -hmm. body and say goodbye. Wonderful work, and sturdy too. Very sturdy. Wow. And the people from Springfield and those who visit Springfield know what this is. This is a, a, a wonderful model of, the, uh, of his tomb at, uh, at Oak, Oak Ridge Cemetery. Fantastic work. This was also part of the Inter Illinois Funeral Director's yes, uh, it was. collection. And you all are very fortunate to have, uh, have been able to get a hold of that. Putting it to good use. And you have another intern who we're going to meet later on in the program who is a, a history student working on a master's degree, I guess. That's correct. And she has put together a, a morning, a, a morning expression display here about what was going on in the country. Right. At the time. Again, when we spoke with the IFDA about our vision for the collection, should it transfer to us, what we told them was that our mission as as the Kibbe is to talk about and interpret. Uh, social history of Hancock County in Western Illinois, and so rather than focusing focusing specifically on funeral customs, it, as a standalone. Um, exhibit. We're interpreting this through what, why was mourning, why were mourning customs uh, so ostentatious during this period? Um, and so what we really want to talk to people about in this area is the fact that so many people had died. Everybody had lost a loved one. Uh, the president had just died. So the nation yeah. is in shock and grief. And at the same time, Queen Victoria is mourning her husband. And, and she was the, kind of the Princess Diana of her time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so and was very ostentatious in her own morning. And so you see jewelry getting larger and more ornate, the hair jewelry mm -hmm. collections, the, the very strict rituals and timelines for how long a woman wore black and then she could shift to gray and shades of lavender. And what did, what did all that really mean to express to other people as a society? And these folks still had to come back and build their communities and still push westward mm -hmm. uh, into the rest of the country. Um, and that's that's the that's the lens through which we want people to take a look at this. That these were real people struggling with a tremendous amount of grief. Mm -hmm. Bruce Leatham, you're not only a mortician, you you must also be an architect and a designer as well. Because because I mean you have an you have an interest in this field. Absolutely. But this East Room of the White House that you created is it's really phenomenal. Well, thank you. It looks like you've been doing design work for a long time. Well, I've, I've always done my own carpentry work, you know, so I've, I've, I've enjoyed that very much over the years. I did a lot of that in my own home. Mm -hmm. um, but in creating this, uh, we, we wanted to go for the, the impact of, of what actually went on in 1865 and, and how 
Abraham Lincoln Lyons stayed in the East Room of the White House, mm -hmm. and so we created created this. You had some photos to work with. I have one right here I'm going to pull out and put in the light so we can see it. Of course, this room is not nearly as big or as high. The ceilings aren't as high. But you did have something to start with. Yes. We, uh, of course, the, the catafalque, you know, We've, we've tried to recreate this one from that and scaled it down. And the basic architecture of the room is the same as it was then. The white walls are different in that uh, back then it was Victorian and they were, they were covered with a, uh, a red Victorian wallpaper mm -hmm. that was kind of... There was a lot of gaudiness. Yes, yeah. the, the Victorians mm -hmm. liked color. Mm -hmm. So we... We want to go with the white walls and the, the basic architecture of the East Room so that people could identify that that's what it was. And, and people today are going to more identify with mm -hmm. as they would see it today. One thing that people may never see again is an exact replica of, of, the, uh, of the, the Lincoln uh, uh, casket. Yes. Um, there are only, what, five of those in existence? Five in existence. Uh, this was made, there was a gentleman... Uh, that belonged to the Illinois Funeral Directors Association who was a past president of the association and is a Lincoln historian and uh, he and his wife did all the research into the size and the design and the ornamentation on the casket and they took it to the Batesville Casket Company and had this reproduced and it was given to the Illinois Funeral Directors Association. In fact, they gave two to the association, mm -hmm. and one went in the permanent museum, and one was in a mobile museum. Mm -hmm. And so this, was Batesville the same company that made the original one? Yes. No, 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 no. The one that, that yeah. no, no, no. Uh -uh. Okay. no, they didn't make Lincoln's original mm -hmm. casket. But this is an exact, exact replica. Yes. Come with me, if you would. Sure. After the Lincoln's body left the White House, it went on a long trip across uh, the eastern part of the country and the, and the midwestern part of the country. 1,600 miles. You have a model uh, of the train, of the, of the funeral train. Yes. Um, this was recreated by Dr. Weslowski, who is a, uh, a historian, an engineer, and a model builder. And he recreated this uh, for the museum in Springfield. Mm -hmm. And, of course it came to us with the collection. Mm. And it is in exacting detail. Uh, it, it's just perfect. Wow. And of course, this the fellow that's on this video up here, is that the fellow we're talking about? Is yes. The, he's the that's, model maker. Yes, okay, so, he's the model so maker. So you have him running here and people that come to the museum can see him and hear him tell about Absolutely. the experience. Absolutely, yes. We also have, this is, the, people will find this fascinating. The, the first stop, of course, Washington, D.C. to Baltimore and then the funeral train went up to, uh, to uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and Harrisburg, then up to New Jersey, across, New clear across New York, yes, and, uh, and then back down here, okay, across then Pennsylvania, into Ohio, into Indiana, up to Chicago, as we can see on that face, and then down where he lays rest in Springfield. Correct. And the reason I wanted to point out Chicago is because if we look over into that case over there, there is another model. This is the funeral arch that was erected in Chicago, and Dr. Weslowski would tell you who the architect was that designed it, and I don't remember his uh -huh. name. But the man that designed this was the same man that created the Chicago Water Tower that survived the great Chicago fire. Uh -huh. This structure was from the ground to the top of the Eagles was 40 feet tall and was slightly over 51 feet wide. Uh, it was in, structured in a place where the railroad came right up to it mm -hmm. and then the horse-drawn hearse that's in here is an exact replica, uh, scaled down of course, mm -hmm. of what was used in Chicago to move Lincoln's mm -hmm. casket through the arch and then on to uh, the city uh, Cook County courthouse mm -hmm. where the, the, he lay in state. Mm -hmm. And, and if we look at the casket, I think we're close to where we look at the casket, you can see that it, they, the, the amount of detail is phenomenal because we just saw a yes. replica of the casket. It yes. looks just like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, this experience in Chicago gives you some 
idea, I think. Each city had, had a, a very memorable, in their own individual way, of commemorating his passing through oh, the Oh, yeah, city. and this each one of them one tried example. to outdo the other, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, this was the largest arch that was created in the 1,600-mile journey, mm -hmm. um, but there was one in, in Ohio. There was almost one in every city where they, they had a service of some type. Mm -hmm. um, it was really quite interesting, but the, the nation truly was a nation in mourning, and they, they went all out to honor the president. Marlena Heberman, during this period of time, I mean, the whole nation was in mourning. Right. Uh, One percent of the male population had been killed in the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln had just been assassinated. And mourning sort of took on a national importance, didn't it? That's right. It? It did. Mourning was something that permeated the entire society, especially for women. Mourning was something that uh, went into every part of their life. And there were different stages for different types of mourning, whether it was a widow, a child, uh, grandparent, and so on. Mm -hmm. Now you're an intern and you're, and you're majoring in history. In fact, you have a degree in history and you're getting yes. an advanced degree in history at Western, right. Western Illinois. Mm -hmm. So you had probably had a great time going through all this old stuff, didn't you? I really did. This is a lot of fun. I love being able to touch things that people have touched in the past and being able to understand what it meant for them to be able to wear these things and to use them in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fast, mourning is a fascinating cultural um, um, uh, exhibit of emotion. If Look down here, one of the things you pointed out to me was during, and we're looking at this stationery down here, mm -hmm. during mourning, even your stationery yes. would be outlined in black. Yes, um, what the reason for this is that it was considered fashionable to show the world that you were in mourning, not just by your dress, but also that it had touched every part of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was edged in black to show that you were in deepest mourning and deepest grief, even to people that you sent out that wouldn't see you, they would see by your stationery that you were in mourning. Mm -hmm. And it's very possible, you can see the kind of gloves that ladies that ladies used to wear. Up here you can see the pendants and the, and the uh, pins. On the right there, number eight, you can see that uh, sometimes they would, they would have the name of the person that they were mourning for right. uh, on a pin. Even even hairpins, I assume these are hairpins. They are, yes. They would be used to hold back a bun or a braid. Everything in black. Yes. Everything in black. Sometimes you would see that you would get the pictures of the loved ones. Yes, that's very popular. People would wear their uh, photos on a brooch or a watch chain or a pendant to be able to show that they were mm -hmm. still carrying the memory of the deceased with them. Uh, you, you might still do that today, but one thing you would not do today that they did back then is make, take the hair from the decedent, uh, from the deceased, and make, is that jewelry? It is jewelry. Uh, people would wear hair, um, not necessarily close to their own hair, but they would take pieces of hair from the deceased person and they would weave it into jewelry. That was actually a very popular pastime for ladies. And they would wear it on their person to show that they were so remembering the person that they longed for and grieved for. I'll be darned. And to carry that tradition over a little further, um, this box is, uh, uh, describe what's going on here. Think of this as sort of a family portrait in a very different sort of sense than you're used to. These are pieces of hair from different members of a family. Um, these are pieces of hair that have been taken from, say, mom, grandma, dad, brother, sister. I'm not sure which one is the deceased, mm -hmm. but this is a way to memorialize everyone in the family and to remember the deceased person, but also to remember that you are still a family unit, even though that person's no longer there with you. Before a lot of modern photography, I imagine that was, that was, that was the way to do that, rather than exactly. have a group, a group portrait. Yes, and this would hang wow. in your parlor, your vestibule, mm -hmm. and it was just sort of that everyone understood that that's what it was. I'll be darned. Now, there was a period when, when a woman was in mourning mm -hmm. where she was in very, what you'd call deep mourning, deep mourning, the mourning yes. right after a death. And at that point, she would cover more of her head, I guess. Yes, she would cover her head and so that not much of her hair was showing. And she would wear something very simple, not a lot of ruffles or frills, just something very simple and very mm -hmm. black. A bonnet. Yes. And to bonnet. cover her whole head. Yes. And as the morning became less and less intense, as mm -hmm. time went on, she could change and... She was allowed to show more of her hair. It was considered appropriate for her mm -hmm. to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. And then see the jewelry is more ornate on top. Uh, uh -huh. It's more okay. bedazzled. Which means, okay, she, she can draw more attention to herself yes. now. Yes. Okay. Th these, are, these are interesting up here, and I think you had a good time looking for these, didn't you? Yes, I did. I found these in an archives. They were stuffed into a folder 
um, part of my job was to go through and to catalog the things that we found. And I thought these were beautiful to illustrate this period. You can see that mourning touched even the children, and that there were certain codes that were expected to be followed. They weren't just for women, they were for children, to show mm -hmm. that they were also in mourning for a mother or a father or a loved one. And you can see that the little boy has a blue cap. So that's mm -hmm. something that would be continued of that. Mm -hmm. And actually, there is some other color in it, too. It looks like there's some color down here. Yes. That they've incorporated. These in. are hand-colored sketches that we were able wow. to transfer onto prints. Oh, nice. And, of course, here's an example of, of the way a woman would have been dressed in, in mourning yes. uh, shortly after a death. Yes, she's covered in head to toe from black. She does have, it uh, looks like a white handkerchief and no gloves. Mm -hmm. or she has a glove on one hand but the veil even comes down all the way to the back. Mm -hmm. And she's vest dressed very simply with no visible jewelry. Do, do your friends think this is all kind of macabre, which you've gotten yourself into here? Some of them have thought <laughs> that it's a little uh, different, but they're uh, not surprised. Uh, this is what I love to do, and it's, mm -hmm. it's very interesting to show that people grieve in a way that we don't anymore. And it's, I think it's something that's fascinating that people like to learn about. Mm -hmm. So it is macabre in a way, but yeah. it's also sort of oddly fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. Nathan Pierce, thank God for interns, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're also a history, uh, you have a master, you're working on working a master's, on master's degree in history at Western Illinois. And so you really probably enjoy going through these old pictures and trying to figure out who some of these guys are. Mm -hmm. We have a whole part of the exhibit here which is made up of individuals, most of them are local, uh, who were in various aspects uh, of the Civil War, many in the, what, the 118th? 118th is okay. the majority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you were able to identify, end up identifying a lot of these people just from photographs that had no names on them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Pretty interesting. Now, you mentioned the name Fonda to me. Where do we see Fonda? Uh, John G. Fonda right here. Mm -hmm. And then it would also be him here in the picture. The command staff would be the one in the middle. He was a captain when he started, and then uh, he got promoted to colonel right away, and he actually commanded Camp Butler over in Springfield, where a lot of the uh, oh. Illinois Civil War people kind of yep. mustered in hat. So he commanded there for a little bit and made colonel, and then they put him in, uh, in charge of the 118th mm -hmm. Illinois. Yeah, and he was from Warsaw. And he actually made brevet general at one point right at the end of the war. It was a mm -hmm. temporary promotion, but he was a general t for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. so. These, uh, the, the 118th mustered in were at Warsaw? Uh, no, they were uh, Camp Butler as well. Oh, they okay, in Springfield. Yeah, so they all came from Hancock County for mm -hmm. the most part, and then Camp Butler was kind of the, the, mm -hmm. the overall meeting point, mm -hmm. I guess you'd say. You know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the biographies of these people is at best sketchy. So you had a lot of phone calling and a lot of contacting of families, didn't you, to try mm -hmm. to identify some yes. of these folks? Yeah, I had a lot of helpful people that uh, luckily had some background information that had been passed down from family, so that, that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, 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 through your efforts, you were able to track down a photograph and a bio of, of a very important individual. We didn't know much about this fellow, did we? No. no. Who, who is he? It's David H. Johnston. Uh, he enlisted in Warsaw, Illinois. And, he, uh, we knew that there was a Medal of Honor winner from Warsaw, and, and, but the, no one had ever found a photograph mm -hmm. on him. So I did a, kind of a genealogy search on him, and I started looking up some things and found out that he was buried in uh, Merritt County, Nebraska. So I called their library to see what information they had, and they referred me to some local historians, mm -hmm. and then who also referred me on to a family member that they happened to know. And they were, uh, fortunately, they were kind enough to uh, co copy the picture for us and send it. So I bet that was a museum. thrill, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, because as far as we knew, there's no no photographs ever remaining existing of the guy. So I yeah. um, got an original photograph of his uh, uh, medal of, his of honor, honor too. Wow, so that is that's a find. That, that is a pretty find. And you're going to continue this work, aren't you? Yes, yes. So over the summer, we're going to continue developing biographies on these guys and uh, using some of uh, Muster and Log original from 1862 when these guys joined. It's mm -hmm. the original that the officer had signed and wrote statistics in. and So that and some memoirs that have been unpublished that we uncovered, so. Yeah, good work, yeah. good work. Kim, back to local people again who served in the Civil War from this area. You really, your, your group really got fortunate because a fellow from Colchester, born in Colchester, from Colchester, named Hobart, apparently was the historian for his unit in the Civil War. Unofficially. Um, you never know who it's going to be, but every military unit always seems to have somebody who considers it important enough to invest the time to keep up with people mm -hmm. and maintain the records. And um, 
Ed, Edwin was very active in the GAR, which was a union veterans organization that held reunions every year. And he collected these photographs of his friends. Um, and then this is his arrangement. He took this to a print shop and had this made up. Mm -hmm. And somewhere, we've since lost uh, the, the data and time, but he actually numbered all these people to tell who they were. He was also very active uh, as an officer in the GAR and traveled across the country as a delegate to San Francisco. Um, I think we've got something from Iowa here. Um, so he went oh, around the country and, and oh. met people uh, and, and followed up with their stories. And so as a former intelligence officer, this is great kind of material because it allows us to go back and say these were people with whom he had personal connections. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of start tracking who the informal groups were within the organization. Mm -hmm. And you have his entire collection just, just as it was. What a break. What a great deal. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, and, and just a, as an example, too, of some of the items that you have here, there's a, another local fellow named Tom Mix who was a very, very young man when, when he uh, mustered, into, uh, mustered into the Army. Right. He was 18 when he went into the Army. Uh, he died in a skirmish near Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And what his family had left of him was his childhood hobby horse and a Civil War diary, which we also have a copy of here mm -hmm. in the museum. Wow. Lincoln, The Making of a Man, is a permanent exhibit. It will undergo some changes, but you can see it here for a long time to come. With another Illinois story in Carthage, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.